we are in Oxford, this is the time when some of these colleges are established. You already have a lot of students at Oxford yeah. and it's, it's growing. So it's, it's the size of a village, but, it's, it's, but you have uh, lots of people coming to Oxford and uh, it's growing. So this is a 1644 map of Oxford. Uh, already you have a lot of scholars stranded here. And then this is the famous Anthony Wood map. And so this is the time of, of Willis. And then they kept modifying this map. But you can see basically it's a very small place, but you have lots of scholarship. And then you have the civil war <laughs> yeah. coming. And all these people are stranded here in Oxford. According to Ian Pierce, they couldn't get a job. So they stayed here and they started doing very smart things to entertain themselves. And this is the time also when some cannonballs were fired into St. John's, my own college. <laughs> and uh, this is when you had the three sieges of Oxford. We know very little about the historic background. Yeah. I don't understand anything, you know, what happened really here and how the king escaped, then, you know, what happened exactly. So if you could talk a little bit about this, and then we could mingle uh, Willis's life which really coincided with all this. And um, mm -hmm. this is where he was born. The, then he uh, matriculated at Christ Church, he signed his name. Then he actually, he, he managed to get his degree without any medical studies because of the civil war. So, That's right. so they issued this certificate for him and then he started practicing. Uh, then you have the restoration and then in the last nine years of his life, he moved to London and then he died in 1675. So, so this is the historic uh, background. So if you could enlighten us. Sure. Uh, I'll, tr I'll yeah. try to enlighten as much as I can. I think, look, one of the things which I think is so fascinating about this period and one of the things which is uh, probably difficult for us to remember now is how messy, dirty, complicated Oxford was, um, and also about um, study in general. So I think this this time period is such an exciting time period. It's such a, a great period of intellectual ferment, but I think there's also this, this concern we have as historians, right? So what did people think of it as the time? How do we see Willis at the time? Many people, including himself, would have described him as a rather orthodox, even kind of conservative, individual both intellectually very much religiously right he was very pious very much a strong anglican this explains a lot of what happens during his career and yet of course then we now think of him as being this major innovator someone who rethinks all sorts of approaches so i think there's this kind of interesting tension between our way of looking back and then his actual position in the time um, it's clear that the course of the Civil War shapes his research and his practice, right? One of the, the major ways we can think about this is it's very likely he would have gone into um, divine orders, would have been someone much more associated just strictly with religious practice, but because of the Civil War, then he takes up the practice of medicine. Um, and, and I think what's very interesting, someone who does, as someone who's a historian of medicine, thinking about what medical practice is like at that time, right? So this is a, it's it's one that means that he's involved with patients um, and that he's very much focused on observation, clinical observation, and he keeps these wonderful books and case books that we have. But it's also interesting to remember that even though he starts practicing medicine in the 1640s, he doesn't actually become very wealthy until probably the 1650s and later. So he's actually, right, there's a way in which we can think about as much as we think of him now as being this great thinker and a man of intellect, those early years, he's very much someone who's practicing a, a kind of lowly practice, which is hands-on medicine. Um, so, so I think there's, we can think about the, the role of observation, maybe in the long term, about what medicine is granting him, and the, the role of the kind of discussions and debates that are happening in Oxford across the 1640s, across the 1650s. Um, for someone, since I work on the history of disease, I always thought it was great that he's in Oxford. And for him, the Civil War is also about troops being stationed. A lot of scholarship 
simply at a standstill and instead the city turning into a kind of garrison town right so huge problems with disease an outbreak of what is like Ken Peebles both of his parents died in Ken Peebles exactly and, and I think it's it's very likely that it's typhus typhus is highly contagious very high mortality rates um but for Willis what that gives him an opportunity to do is to actually practice clinical observations and the same thing with the plague which has an outbreak in 1645 so I think there's this 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 uh, this disruption of Oxford, that is not just a place about academic scholarship. But then, of course, at the same time, he's part of this circle, right, of, of these men in the 1650s, who above all are experimenting, who are interested in trials and in what historians call manual exploration, right, of, of not just discussing and debating ideas, but actually thinking about practice and how that works. And I think that's very fundamental to where we see Willis's trajectory happening, but also working with other people. Um, I'm sure you might know this, but there's this, there's been various historical debates about whether or not Willis did all the work himself. Um, the role of dissection and, and anatomy is such a major one, right? He has this wonderful phrase about how he becomes addicted to the opening of heads. Um, but what we also know is very likely, which was following tradition at the time, that he's not the one who's likely doing all the manual work, right? He's relying on, particularly on Richard Lower, who kind of gets described as his hands. Um, so I think there's, again, to me, what's interesting about Willis is on the one hand, he's this traditional conservative, pious Anglican who remains an Anglican throughout, who then of course gets rewarded with the restoration in the 1660s with his position partly because he's been so steadfast and loyal, but he's also practicing things which at the time would have been seen as rather unusual, right? Empirical practices, being an empiric, those are problematic, if not dirty words, um, especially for, for men who are, who are trained in a kind of more traditional academic scholastic tradition. Um, so I, I, I don't know, so it's a, it's a fascinating period because I think in many ways it actually upsets our assumptions about what we think people are doing at a place like Oxford. Um, we're now much more associated with learned men <laughs> reading books, <laughs> having civil conversation, rather than thinking just about this notion of um, manual exploration and um, empirical medicine. But what was interesting is that that group had an amazing contribution to all sorts of disciplines, including architecture, astronomy, yeah. Uh, yeah, chemistry. So uh, there must have been something in the air in those years <laughs> in Oxford. According to Ian, Ian Pierce, yeah. uh, it was probably because they were lined up to have some other jobs yeah. uh, normally. And now they just couldn't move out of Oxford and they just enjoyed uh exploring things and, yeah. uh, and then you had this uh, um, intellectual so-called fermentation which which yeah. led to all these discoveries yeah. yeah i think it's so willis has made me think about this a lot and also i have to say i'll, I'll admit in the context of right now when we're talking about the vaccine for covid 19 and the work in oxford and this notion about oxford as being this place of innovation and and rapid innovation and research and i was thinking how look, just like now, we always want to remind ourselves that a lot of this innovation is built on actually a very long standing tradition of uh, practice of having a space where you can conduct research. And, and I think there's still this, there's a broad historical debate, right? Is it about the individuals? Is there something particular about the time and place of Oxford? Um, do we just say that there's some kind of a special genius that's going on? Is it just that they happen to be together at their time? I agree that there's, look, there's a lot of intellectual ferment that's coming from the continent, right? So a lot of them are reading the work or are responding to the work of people like Descartes. And that's why I think Willis is such a fascinating figure because it's not obvious at the time that people are gonna place him as someone who's an innovator, right? And I think there's been a lot of debate among historians about how to see him. Should we see him as being the forerunner of how we now understand neuroanatomy? should we what happens when we think about it in his perspective which of course is within a very in some ways almost traditional religious framework of trying to understand the soul 
and trying to understand how the function of the body works and how it relates to anatomy. So I think he's a he's such a um, fascinating figure because he forces us to really question our assumptions about what's innovation. What do we think of as being novel thoughts and novel approaches? I feel like I, I'm <laughs> I'm kind of undecided about the notion of of scientific circles because I think it's clear that the combination of those men um, who are doing such wonderful things in such different areas, such different disciplines is, is something, right? There's something very special about having people coming together and working together. I think it's also a good reminder for us about how, especially with Willis, he's not someone who's working on his own, right? Especially his reliance on someone like Lower to do so much of that work. That's not what he's interested in per se, but he needs that in order to actually rethink um, and come up with his his framework but then so useful for for understanding anatomy and physiology but he managed to combine uh, his clinical practice uh, teaching and research and also he published heavily as a team work he's acknowledging his students also uh, you have acknowledgments for uh, for Christopher Wren for the illustrations in in, yeah. in, in his book so it was probably a, a teamwork but as a as a neuroscientist, what I love about his work is that he wanted to find some rational explanations. And when he dissected sheep, human, and other species, then he, he could see that the largest brain, the largest cerebral cortex was in human. And then he started arguing that it has to be the tissue of the cerebral cortex, which is unique for human. Um, so that, that should be the source of the higher cognitive function. And then he, when he's, he was dissecting his own uh, patients who died, then he discovered that some of them they had, uh, which had um, um, all sorts of physiological uh, abnormalities like epilepsy or learning disabilities or learning uh, difficulties, uh, they had altered shape of the brain. So basically what, what was interesting is that when he dissected his own patients after they died, then he, he noticed that uh, sometimes there was a morphological abnormality on the shape of the brain of these yeah. patients. And then, so putting together the, the comparative analysis and also the, um, um, the hist histopathological analysis, the pathological analysis, he proposed that it has to be the tissue of the cerebral cortex, which is responsible for the higher cognitive functions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's unique. For me, that is one of the biggest. You know. I think, look, and I was thinking about how, isn't it, it, isn't it interesting though, that all of this is on a framework about that if you, that you, Right, that you need to understand structure. So there's something very fundamental about anatomy, but comparative anatomy um, for Willis and for others at the time, but to, to think about understanding structure so that you can understand function. And so I think, again, there's a, right, there's, so there's similarities in how we approach things, but I think for him, it's also a, a broader framework for thinking about how to make sense of the world, right? There's a, there's a point about the design of nature for him, which, perhaps we still have, but I think there's also, there's some of that, which obviously we don't connect to a kind of religious framework, which I think was obvious and just kind of taken for granted. I mean, you know, as I, I agree with you, Willis seemed to accomplish a huge amount, um, um, but you're right, the, the teaching, the writing, the thinking, the, the dissection, and of course the going to church every day, right? So, and, and for him, those are all uh, interrelated activities. Was there a similar period in the life of Oxford, uh, like a similarly productive period, like like just before, during, and after the Civil War, when all these scholars were stranded in Oxford, and rather than ending up in jobs, they were actually doing experiments, establishing the Royal Society, and contributing to science in many, many different ways. The interesting thing is for the, the period I work on in the 18th century, I will say that Oxford is not necessarily at the center of scientific and medical ferment, right? And, and one of the complaints that you often deal with is actually from students saying that um, it's to other universities and other locations that people go if they want to know what is cutting edge research at the time. Um, so definitely for, for medicine, I'll confess, it's, it's places on the continent or even the Scottish universities. and. What's interesting there though, is that's also again, an argument about its people in some ways, especially the Scottish university. Sometimes it's individuals who are 
on the outside, right, who are excluded from the centers of power, who are actually very interested in, in rethinking some of those frameworks. So I think we can also think about how is it because the 17th century in some ways so much is up for grabs, right? There's a constant debate about all sorts of fundamentals. Does that mean in some ways people are free? Because I think the, the, the notion of freedom of speech, right? What you can talk about, what you can claim, belief, um, those, are, those are at the heart of, of England in the 17th century in a way that then, for example, for us, perhaps we can, although we understand that there's political conflicts today in our own worlds, obviously I don't think the stakes are as high as they would have been some for many of these practitioners in the early modern period. So I actually think you can see how there's times in which security might also mean that people aren't forced to, to rethink approaches. And I mean, the thought is, is, is this about methodology, right? As much as it's about the content of what one is looking at. And I think there's something very interesting in terms of that, those clinical observations and that attention to empirical approaches that we see in Willis's work, which might be coming from precisely this unusual experience of the practice of medicine um, alongside then his opportunity though, to have the professorship from the 1660s onwards. So yeah. Willis probably never left England. But there was uh, the tradition was that uh, these scholars they were educated in on the continent in Leiden, yeah. Padua, uh, uh, Paris, and especially the anatomy uh, was stronger in those yeah. days uh, yeah. on the continent. So, do you think that uh, Willis was interacting with some of these people coming back from from Europe? It's a good question, and I don't know enough about whether he's actually interacting with individuals. It's, but it's clear that, for example, the circle that he's part of in Oxford, they are intellectually responding to those people, right? And it's clear, for example, in Willis's own theories and his writing, he's thinking about individuals such as Gessen. Boyle, so he, yeah. yeah. So, so, and I, and again, I think this is an interesting point about do people think that England is actually the place where things are happening or actually are most people assuming that the continent is where real, um, real research happens? Now in retrospect, we can kind of see what's happening. But I think, again, it's, a, it's an interesting point about people at the time thinking about these places as a kind of backwater. And actually now we can appreciate the, the kinds of advances that are being made. Excellent. So thank you for putting um, this period into context. So what is your favorite story about Willis? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I think, obviously, I feel like everyone knows the story about Anne Green and the convicts uh, and the body. But I actually, I'll be honest, I think what I actually think is so fascinating about Willis is thinking about how he's working with other people. I, and partly it's because I think as an academic working today, we it makes us realize that we have our own very clear definitions when we talk about authorship and innovation and who's responsible for what. And then when we look at Willis and his relationship with Richard Lower and the debates that historians have had about, is he taking advantage of Lower? Is he using him for these other things? Does he not give him enough credit? And I think it's such a useful reminder to us that research is collaborative in a very broad as well as a very specific way and that actually we sometimes have a lot of difficulty trying to recapture that as a historical practice and how much that changes um, in, in terms of how we now research and how we have multi-authored works and whatnot. So um, the teamwork. Yeah. 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 In, in fact, after Willis's death, uh, his theories on fever were attacked and actually Richard Lauer defended him in, in his, his publication. Yeah. So there, was, there must have been a very deep loyalty uh, there. So it must yeah. have been a very good team. <laughs> well, and, and that's what I think is so interesting, right? Our notion that if you put your name on something, it's just authored by you, probably says much more about our own assumptions to do with um, who is responsible for what in terms of research. And I, I think it doesn't capture the way that early modern research and, and practice actually takes place. Thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah, that, that was fantastic. Thank you.